The Apostolic Fathers is a term assigned to leaders and writers in the early church era who had been in contact with or were taught by one or more of Jesus' apostles. The era from the death of John, the last apostle, to the death of Polycarp, John's longest living apostle, is also called the Sub-Apostolic Era and lasted from about AD 98 to 155. This first generation of early church fathers is held in high esteem because their writings reflect the teaching of the apostles before councils, creeds, and extensive hierarchy developed in the church. A leader in the Roman church named Clement is credited with writing a letter on behalf of the Roman church to their fellow Christians in the Corinthian church. Little is known of Clement of Rome other than what appears in the letter itself. Although the letter does not explicitly bear his own name, he does mention that he was a disciple of Peter and Paul, but does not consider himself on the level of the apostles. Church historians recognize Clement as the fourth overseer of the Roman church, following the apostle Peter and two other overseers. Much later tradition suggests that Clement traveled to Palestine, wrote many books, and became a martyr by drowning while attached to an anchor in the Black Sea. The letter, or epistle, to the Corinthians was probably written in about AD 96. According to the first paragraph, it is the Roman Church's response to the Corinthian Church's inquiry about what to do following an incident in which some younger people caused an uproar and had some of their church presbyters, or elders, removed from their positions. Now, to be clear, there was no single building that housed all the Christian congregations either in Rome or in Corinth. The first dedicated church building was not founded until the middle of the 3rd century. Up until this time, all churches met in houses or other places that had many other uses besides as a religious meeting place for Christians. Therefore, this may have been limited to leaders of certain house churches in Corinth or for any local council the leaders may have held. In closing, Clement enjoined the Corinthian Christians to prioritize love and to repent as the occasions might warrant. At the northeast corner of the Mediterranean Sea, one will find the city of Antioch, a few miles inland on the Orontes River. It is in a very important location because it links the eastern and western worlds, and it soon became an important city to trade, politics, and religion that connected the eastern and western worlds. In 64 BC, General Pompey of the Roman army captured the city of Antioch from the Greeks, and it remained an important city in the Roman Empire for many centuries. One can imagine the variety of religious conversations overheard in the city streets from the Greeks, Romans, Egyptians, and Phoenicians who established their places of worship throughout the city. Add to the mix a few Eastern cults and no small number of Hellenistic Jews who were brought to the city or migrated there when it was still controlled by the Greeks. It was a truly cosmopolitan city which reflected the cultural and religious diversity of its population, but all under Roman rule. Following the martyrdom of Stephen in Jerusalem in the mid-30s AD, many followers of Jesus migrated northward to Antioch to take refuge there, Acts 8.1 and 11.19. This is where followers of Jesus were first called Christians, Acts 11.26. The earliest and most well-known Christian missionary work of the first century had its genesis in Antioch. Paul and Barnabas were sent out by the Church of Antioch to the northern Mediterranean world. Paul's three missionary journeys and his trip to Rome were responsible for the spread of Christianity to the Jews and Gentiles around the Roman Empire. By the end of the first century, Antioch had a population of 300,000 making it the third largest city in the Roman Empire, many of whom were Christians. It was not only an important city to the empire, but to Christianity in its earliest and most vulnerable stage. Christians in Antioch were among the most persecuted Christians in the Roman Empire. Some well-known monastic communities also spread east from Antioch. Before and after Christianity became the legal and eventually official religion of the Roman Empire in the 4th century, Antioch was recognized as one of the major centers of Christianity. It boasted a robust theological school to train people for ministry that rivaled the theological schools in Alexandria and Carthage. Since the city's population was so big, its location so crucial to the exchange of ideas, and its school so influential, 
the bishops of Antioch would wield significant influence over matters of church doctrine for centuries to come in the early church era. Along with Rome, Constantinople, Alexandria, and Jerusalem, the city of Antioch was crucial to the growth and direction of Christian life and thought. Toward the end of the first century AD, Ignatius became the third overseer, or bishop, of the churches in Antioch at the northeast corner of the Mediterranean Sea. His bishopric also included the churches in the region of Syria. There was no central church building in Antioch or Syria. The church was made up of a series of house churches around town and throughout the countryside. While the exact date of Ignatius' birth is uncertain, Historians believe it was either in A.D. 30 or 35. He had such a close relationship with God that he was given the nickname Theophorus, which means one who bears God. A much later tradition changed the Greek slightly to Theophorus, which means one whom God bears. The claim was thus made that Ignatius was the little child whom Jesus placed on his lap in the 18th chapter of Matthew. Thus, it was later held that God in the flesh bore Ignatius on his knee. By describing Ignatius' birth during Jesus' ministry, the story does demonstrate that Ignatius was likely in his 70s when he was arrested and put on trial in Antioch before Emperor Trajan himself, or before one of his emissaries. Though nothing is known about the trial itself, Christians in that era were often brought before a magistrate or governor, questioned along with witnesses as to if they really were Christians, and then punished accordingly. The result of the trial is that Ignatius was found guilty of being a Christian and therefore sentenced to death. Most of what is known to us about the life and beliefs of Ignatius come from his seven letters, or epistles, written to six churches and to Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna. These seven letters were written in about AD 107 when Ignatius was escorted by Roman soldiers from Antioch to Rome. While he was on his way to Rome, he was visited by many Christians who were guilty of the same crime of which Ignatius had been convicted, simply being a Christian. His first major stop along the way was in the town of Smyrna, where Polycarp was the bishop. From that location, Ignatius wrote letters to the churches in Ephesus, Magnesia, and Tralles, which lay to the south of Smyrna. He also sent another letter ahead to Rome. When he arrived at Troas, he wrote letters to the churches in Philadelphia and Smyrna, as well as to their bishop, Polycarp. How did Ignatius die? His epistle to the Romans indicates that he was anticipated being attacked by wild beasts in the Roman Colosseum for the entertainment of the crowd. Ignatius set an example for the early church by going so far as to say, May I enjoy the wild beasts who are prepared for me, I want them to rush upon me, and I will urge them to do devour me quickly. Ignatius was not suicidal. He was wanting the Roman Christians to not interfere with his martyrdom. So as he had lived for Christ faithfully, Ignatius might also die for Christ faithfully. Polycarp received word of Ignatius' successful martyrdom. Ignatius would be revered in all corners of the Christian church throughout her history as a holy example of one who bore God faithfully in his life, death, and writings.